Hello and welcome to the Korean Beauty Show podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Lee, founder of Style Story, where you can shop, learn and explore the world of Korean skincare, as well as your guide to everything that you need to know to perfect your K-beauty routine. Welcome back to another episode. You may have noticed that our episodes are back to the front this week. Normally, I do my news update segment on the Tuesday's episode, and then on Thursday, we do our deep dive. However, if you did listen to Tuesday's episode, you will also know that I am traveling at the moment. I am not in Korea. I have made a trip back home to Australia, and as usually happens when you are not in your usual locations and your usual familiar spots, We had a few tech troubles and essentially the audio that I had recorded for last Tuesday's episode was abysmal. I sounded like I was drowning. So what I decided to do is release the deep dive episode for Tuesday, which was the interview that I did with Elle, running through some of the changes that she has seen in her skin in the eight years or so that she has been using Korean beauty products. And I am sitting down now to re-record the news headlines episode for you. Fingers crossed that the audio is going to be a lot clearer. I've changed locations. I've done a few tests and it looks like it's going to be okay. I'm very, very hopeful. Uh, But you will have to forgive me. In the meantime, I've also caught somehow a head cold. (laughs) So Uh, The world is conspiring against me at the moment. But like I mentioned, I am in Australia. I am back in my hometown of Brisbane uh, to catch up on a few work things, to see family and friends, all of that fun stuff. Uh, And as it so happened, I mean, obviously, I keep up with the Australian news uh, as well as the news and what's going on in Korea, uh, because this is where Style Story is based. Style Story, I actually started it from my parents' basement back in the day, many, many years ago now, many moons ago. They've moved houses a few times since then. Uh, But I did start my business, my first business, Style Story, here in Brisbane. Uh, and our warehouse is based out of Sydney. And now, of course, uh, we send our Korean beauty products literally all over the world. We have uh, our brand Jelly Co., which is now, I guess, a global brand. We're sold offline in States uh, at CO Bigelow in New York. And also we are available online in a couple of different retailers in uh, America as well. So this is sort of coming full circle for me. I haven't been back in Australia since 2019 because of the pandemic. Australia was one of the countries that locked the borders, made it basically impossible to uh, come back into the country. Uh, And, you know, with the business and obviously my family being based in Korea, we have a dog as well. I just couldn't really risk getting uh, locked out or, you know, not being able to get back if need be. So I have not been able to make the trip back for a very long time. I was really keen to come and just sort of see what's changed, obviously catch up on what's going on over here, take a look around the stores, which I have now had an opportunity, ample opportunity to go and see what's trending. I put the call out on my Instagram the other day for the Aussies to give me their latest sunscreen recommendations. Obviously, uh, a Korean sunscreens, none that I know of are approved for sale in Australia. Uh, I don't know of any Korean company that's ever put their products through the the local testing that is required to legally sell Korean sunscreens in Australia. And that doesn't give me the confidence to wear them when I am here. Uh, Australia has extremely high UV. We've got some pretty different conditions from the kind of conditions that people in other parts of the world are faced with, particularly when it comes to things like skin cancer, sun damage, all of that Uh, good stuff or rather not so good stuff, stuff that you can avoid by wearing sunscreen. So I was really keen to find out what people are actually using over here to protect their skin. Uh, I just do not feel comfortable at all uh, using my, my regular Korean or Asian sunscreens in Australia. They are just not the same. Uh, and you know, they're not tested in a lot of the same ways or, and they're not labeled in the same ways that a lot of the Australian sunscreens are labeled. For example, um, the broad spectrum, 
Labeling requirements here are quite specific, waterproof requirements as well. So for anyone that's going swimming in a pool or going to the beach or spending a lot of time outdoors, it's quite humid here, sweating and things like that. Uh, the, the sunscreens are just quite different. So I was given a whole bunch of different recommendations. So I went out. I have picked up a few. I'm going to be trying them out. People do sometimes ask me for my recommendations for Australian sunscreens. And seeing as I am not based here anymore, I'm just not the best person to ask. So what I periodically do or what we periodically do is ask our community, tell us what you're using, tell us what you're loving. We compile a list of the most common responses. And then we've published them in a guide that is actually available on our website as well. So for any other Aussies out there, I know it can catch people uh, by surprise sometimes to hear that Korean sunscreens are not uh, tested, are not legally approved for sale in Australia. A lot of people are very surprised by that, particularly because, you know, they've probably heard how good they are. Uh, so if you fall into that category and you're sort of going, oh my gosh, well, what can I use on my skin? Go and check that out on our website. I'll put, I'll put a link in the show notes as well, uh, just to make that a bit easier to find that page of our website. But we've got an explainer up on the website. We've, I've, I've updated it uh, plenty of times over the years as well, uh, just to sort of explain some of the key differences, how sunscreen is actually regulated in Australia. And then we've put together a list, I think, of the top 15 most common or most uh, beloved uh, Australian approved sunscreens. And by that, I mean they are sunscreens that are listed on the ARTG. They have an OSTL number. That is a really quick and easy way to check if the sunscreen that you are using has been uh, listed locally in Australia is to have a look, turn it over and see if it has an AUST-L number on it. That is the Therapeutic Goods Administration's, basically their tick of approval. You can think of it as their tick of approval. So if the sunscreen has been tested, it meets all the requirements to be listed locally, they will give it one of those numbers. If your sunscreen does not have one of those numbers, uh, I mean, you do you basically, but it's not approved to be used in Australia. So look, that's a little bit of a, a side, <laughs> a side sort of tangent. But I know that that is a, a thing that catches a lot of people off guard. They're very surprised to hear that, uh, and people do often ask me what my recommendation is. And being that I don't live here, that I haven't lived here for a very long time, I'm just not the most up to date person to ask. So I usually put the call out to you guys to tell me, and then just pass that information on to anyone else that might be interested in knowing about it. So on to, I guess, some of the, the local news that has been floating around. And this one, I think, caught my attention in particular because I knew I was coming here, is that both Korea and Australia are doing some crackdowns of their own on social media advertisements, deceptive advertising on socials. So Korea's Fair Trade Commission recently released their data on deceptive advertising They've said that they've caught over 20,000 influencers and have issued over 30,000 correction notices. And what they were aiming to do was catch out influencers and people who are not disclosing sponsorships. Uh, so social media, or as we refer to it in Korea, SNS, which stands for Social Networking Services, incorporates a whole bunch of different things. Instagram, obviously, YouTube, Naver blogs is another big way that a lot of people still like to share information about beauty things, supplements, all of that. So that's where the, the uh, regulators were having a look to see what people are doing. And a lot of the people that they caught out, they said, were advertising things like cosmetics, diet supplements, anti-wrinkle supplements, all of that. I remember uh, I discussed last year on um, the radio program that I do that uh, the Ministry for Food and Drug Safety in Korea was also cracking down on the types of claims that companies were using around supplements. There are obviously things that you can say and things that you can't say without extra data or extra uh, you know, regulatory testing and approval to say that, and they were doing a big crackdown last year. And guess who's also doing the same thing? The ACCC in Australia. So they have come out in the news over the last few weeks 
and announced that they are planning to do a big crackdown on Australian influencers. In particular, they are after people who are not disclosing sponsorships. Apparently, they say they've received hundreds of tip-offs. A lot of them are about beauty and lifestyle influencers. And the Australian regulators are also looking at a range of platforms, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, YouTube, Facebook. Does anyone use Facebook anymore for this kind of thing? I'm not sure. But if you, if they do, that's where they're, they're targeting. Twitch as well, which is not one I'm familiar with, but I'm sure some of our audience will be. So the regulators, interestingly, expressed really similar reasons for cracking down. Basically, what they are saying is that with the amount of people shopping online these days, it's really easy for them to be influenced in their purchasing decisions by things that they have seen on social media. And if those ads, which a lot of these are just uh, ads, you know, if they are not following the regulations, following the guidelines, following what they are allowed to say about a certain product, then that's a problem. So that's why they're cracking down. I'm sure Korea and Australia are not the only two countries cracking down on this kind of thing. But as I'm regularly following the news in both countries, I just happen to notice it around the same time, thought that that was a little bit interesting. I mean, look, Korea in particular, they are, I would say, from the perspective of someone that follows quite closely what the TGA does in Australia versus what the Korean regulators do, the Korean regulators, I think, are a little bit more forceful in their enforcement actions, and they regularly do take action against people. I see people in Australia, companies, influencers, including some really big popular influencers, really clearly breaching the law all the time, particularly around the advertising of, you know, Asian sunscreens and things like that. And they never seem to get, uh, they never seem to stop, which leads me to believe that the TGA hasn't issued them with any takedown notices or correction notices. Uh, and that leads me to believe that the TGA is just not as on the ball when it comes to the enforcement type of stuff. The ACCC definitely is. I mean, look, having said that, the TGA, I know for a fact, has in, uh, issued uh, fines against uh, a really popular local vitamin company, JS Health. They do a lot of supplements. They have been issued with quite a few fines. I've, I've noticed on the TGA's Instagram page, they sort of announce, they do a public naming and shaming. And that particular company has been uh, a few times at least fined for making uh, ingredient claims that they couldn't make about one of their products. Uh, you know, the kind of things that the ingredient can do. Uh, that, that was one of them. So, you know, yes and no, but I definitely don't think they're on the ball as the Korean regulator. That seems to be what I've noticed. Now, obviously, I don't work for the TGA. I have no idea what they're actually doing in their spare time. But just the number of high profile and big influencers that are quite influential in the Australian influencing community who are very clearly doing the wrong thing and don't seem to stop. That makes me wonder if the TGA is as on the ball as they should be. Uh, but the ACCC anyway has announced that they are planning to crack down. So I guess watch this space and let's just let's just wait and see. But yeah, that is uh, that was in the headlines, has been in the headlines for a couple of weeks. So I thought I would share that with you guys. Now, the other thing that I thought was a little bit interesting is that Cosmax has announced that they are using AI to develop a new kind of technology. They're calling it their Texture Standard Measurement Technology. And that's a big fancy name for, <laughs> I guess, what they are actually trying to do, which is rather than uh, do a really subjective analysis about how a cosmetic is used, uh, you know, things like viscosity, el elasticity, all the things that, like, I, I guess would uh, impact your experience of the product. Up until now, that's been done, you know, subjectively. So it will differ person to person. They are basically taking that out of the hands of people and putting it in the hands of AI to predict and measure how they the cosmetics will perform without actually applying them. So, they're using technology to quantify specific figures and data. Uh, and you might think, well, why is that even necessary, needed? Like, why are they putting time and money behind this? They're looking to speed up the product development process. 
So what they've done is they've collaborated with some of the researchers at Sungyeong uh, Women's University, and they've actually published the results of their study already uh, in the American Physical Society and also at the International Cosmetics Society, the IF- IFSCC, which was held in London last year. And they're thinking that this is going to be really helpful for the future of customized cosmetics development. So this is the kind of thing that I guess consumers probably won't ever see, won't ever get to experience. But the companies that are making and manufacturing cosmetics, this can be the kind of thing that will make things a little bit easier, maybe hopefully quicker as well. So Cosmax is one of the really big ODMs in the Korean beauty industry, not just in Korea. They manufacture for global cosmetics companies all around the world, lots of health and beauty products. Uh, And they have been behind a lot of the scientific developments in the K-beauty industry as well. Uh, So that has been in the news. The CEO of Cosmax said that he thinks it will be helpful for the future of customized cosmetics, which I've been seeing a lot of industry chat about for the last couple of years as well in Korea. Uh, That is one of the big growth areas as well. Now, rounding off our news headlines, Uh, Beauty Nuri released the results of their data. They basically analyzed the industry news and they came up with the hot words, the hot keywords for January 2023. Uh, And by that, I think they just mean the words that keep popping up again and again in stories, headlines and whatnot in the industry. And the three that they found were cooperation environment and society. So obviously environment goes without saying cooperation. You know, there are a lot of uh, Korean beauty companies, but global beauty companies as well turning to overseas markets. Because of the current economic downturn, a lot of people are looking to new places to expand, to, uh, you know, uh, set, I guess, their their feet down on the ground in a new place and explore the market. So they were the three trends that they were noticing for January 2023. Now, I will take a look at our question of the week, uh, and this was actually sent in to us, and our, uh, I, believe she, I believe she's a listener. She said, thanks so much for these shows. They really help so much. I have a question for Lauren. How long should you give to trial your skincare before deciding if it's working or not? Also, what's the best thing to do with products that you've only used a little bit of that found it doesn't work? I have extremely sensitive eczema-prone skin, and unfortunately, I always have so many products that don't work for me, and they just end up sitting in the cupboard collecting dust. At this point, I don't even know how to tell if the app, uh, if the product is actually helping my skin or not, or, or just not irritating it. <laughs> Any advice would be a huge help. Thank you very much for your question, and oh my gosh, I cannot tell you. I feel like I could have written this myself in terms of just like so sensitive, also eczema prone, and so many things just seem to make it worse. So what I will do is pop a couple of the episodes, the past episodes that I've done covering a few of these topics that you might find helpful. We've got one on eczema prone skin, uh, one on uh, just some mistakes to avoid, particularly when you are uh, introducing new products into your skincare routine. Uh, this is not an easy process. So I know that you feel like you're you're overwhelmed by it and you don't know what's helping or hindering. That unfortunately is very normal. Uh, and there's a couple of different reasons for that. It can take a while for some products to even show that they're working. I think we did an episode a while back on skincare wait times. Like how long will it take before you start seeing results from X, Y, or Z product? So take a listen to that as well. In general, for us sensitive skin, eczema prone, any kind of people that have uh, poor reactions to a lot of products, the number one thing I will always say, and I know this is frustrating, is patch testing your products. It's really impossible to tell what product is causing any issues if you don't test it in isolation from other products. So rather than going out and buying three new things and trying them all at the same time, we would be patch testing one product at a time, introducing each new product in isolation to the others so that you can very clearly tell if your skin is going to play up, if your skin is reacting poorly. Now, I have actually been through the process of having professional patch testing done. I was having so many problems with my skin. Uh, I I did a food allergy panel to rule some things out. And the next step for me was actually doing a professional patch test. 
And the interesting thing with that is that it actually takes the better part of a week because so many reactions are not immediate. They throw up later, you know, three days after you've been exposed to the allergen, five days after you've been exposed to the allergen. Just depends on how strong or weak your particular allergy is. So that is always an option if you really just cannot get to the bottom of it. But unfortunately, that is not the be-all and end-all. Having gone through the process myself, I now know very much what I'm allergic to and what I'm not allergic to, but that doesn't mean that every product that does or doesn't have those ingredients in there, I'm totally fine with. So you can rule out some big ticket things, um, you know, particularly if you have an, uh, an allergy to something like nickel or cobalt or, uh, you know, fragrance, for example. But a lot of the time, it can just be either the combination of products that you're using, uh, you know, or maybe it's a particular time of the year. Maybe it's a combination of, uh, you know, your skin health and your diet at the same time can throw up different, you know, different reactions. So patch testing is definitely going to be really, really important. I also did an episode on what to do with products that you have tested and they don't work for you so that you don't just have to have them sitting there in the cupboard. So I will link to that. Off the top of my head, it was uh, things like, obviously, you can give them to a friend that has a different skin type than you. You can donate them in some countries to women's shelters or you know shelters for homeless people. In the case of things like makeup, Sometimes morgues will even take them. So uh, if they have someone on hand that is doing the makeup for the deceased, they are obviously uh, you know, not going to have the same issues as the living have in terms of you know, having cosmetic allergies. So they can often take used makeup. Uh, so I, I, I ran through a big list of different things you can do. So I'll pop a link to that. And hopefully some of those episodes will have some good tips. But this is an issue that I myself struggle with pretty much every time I introduce a new product to my routine. So I know how hard it is. Uh, my sympathies go out to you because it's it's just annoying. And then you see other people that can go and test everything, you know, walk into like Sephora or something and try all the testers on. And I'm just like, oh gosh, <laughs> how the other half live. <laughs> so if this is you, uh, if you have a similar skin type to our listener, hopefully you can pick up a few tips from those ones as well if you haven't already listened to them. All right, now on to some of the new K-Beauty products that have recently launched on Style Story. One of the ones that I know a few people are excited about is the CKD Retino Collagen Small Molecule 300 Cream. Now, this is a product that is really trending at the moment in Korea. Uh, it's one of this, the, the new crop of products featuring retinol in it, which if you are a frequent listener to the show, you will know. Retinol and K-Beauty are quite a new uh, coupling. Traditionally, K-Beauty has shied away from using things like retinol, but there are newer products entering the market at the moment that have lower level of retinol so that you know you won't experience so many of the downsides, the flaking, the redness, all of those kind of things. This is one of them. So this moisturizer, it has 55% of a low molecular weight water-soluble collagen in it, and it also has a stabilized third-generation retinol as well. Uh, other things include hyaluronic acid and elastin. So they're using a different type of technology that basically helps the ingredients absorb more quickly into the skin. So this kind of product, who it's going to be good for is people that are looking to reduce the appearance of their fine lines, uh, laugh lines, wrinkles, and things like that. Anyone that is, uh, you know, wanting to improve the appearance of their skin's elasticity as well. Uh, and as with all of the products on our website, 1% from the profit of the sales will go towards our pledge for 1% for the planet as well, so that you can share your love of K Beauty with the planet every time you shop at Style Story. Now, the second product that we had. And this is, uh, we are getting more and more requests for products at the luxury end of the market. So this one definitely falls into that category. This one is the History of Who's Jin Yul Hyang Intensive Revitalizing Eye Cream. Gosh, that's a long name. So basically, it is Hanbang style of cosmetic. 
And as you would expect from the hanbang style, we've got some of these really traditional Korean beauty ingredients in it. The key one is the red ginseng, and this is wild ginseng. So obviously, I think I've spoken a few times about the fact that there is a pretty big difference in the ginsengs in your skincare products. And if you really want to get the stated benefits, particularly when it comes to anti-aging, then you are going to be looking at something that is more expensive because wild red ginseng is up there with some of the most expensive hanbang ingredients. Obviously, being wild, it is not cultivated in the same way, so they can't just, you know, get scoop it all up in the mass market. The cheaper your ginseng products are, the higher likelihood that they are using the lower quality ginseng and it does not have the exact same benefits, particularly when it comes to anti-aging as the more expensive types do. So this is just a case of you get what you pay for. These products are expensive. There is absolutely no two ways around it. The history of who is a luxury Korean beauty brand. So if you uh, you know, have that kind of income, if you are happy to put that towards your cosmetic products, then this might be one that you will enjoy has a lot of other really interesting ingredients in it as well, including clover leaf extract, peach kernel extract, a few of my favorites, anthanol, and also glycerin in there as well. Uh, But this one really gently moisturizes the delicate skin around your eyes. It helps to firm the look of it and just reduce the roughness around the eye area as well to give you a refreshed and brighter look. It can also help to uh, diminish the appearance of your fine lines as well. And the eyes are one of the first places that a lot of people will start to notice those little fine lines creeping up. I know I definitely fall into that category as well, particularly when I smile. They turn up even more than they used to. (laughs) So if you are interested in exploring either this type of red ginseng product, if you are interested in the luxury brands, then this is one that you might like to try out, uh, featuring, of course, the wild red ginseng. Now, we've also had some new Korean beauty product reviews left on the website as well, which I will share with you. The first one was a five-star review for April B's propylen, propolis, rather, collagen, propylen, <laughs> propolis collagen eye cream. And our reviewer said, great eye cream. I have very sensitive skin, especially around the eyes. This cream is lovely and has lasted a very long time. So thank you very much for sharing your review. Uh, And the reason it's probably lasted a long time is because it is giant. It is 70 mils, which is really a lot uh, for an eye cream. Eye creams typically run much, much, much smaller. So that one is a really good one if you are looking for a product that you can use for a while. The second review was for Kahi's Multi Balm. And our reviewer said, my skin needed this. On a cleaned face, I gently apply via my fingertips this skin balm and immediately I could feel it sink into my dry skin. I found that a little goes a long way. Great product. So thank you for sharing that with us. And the last one was for Secret Keys Starting Treatment Essence. And our reviewer said, love Secret Key. After two weeks, I noticed skin feeling supple. I normally have very dry skin, but after using Secret Key, it feels more hydrated. So thank you very much to all of the reviewers who left reviews on our website. Uh, Glad to hear that people are enjoying their products. Lots of different ones in there. Uh, If you have, I guess, dry skin, if you're looking for an eye cream. Now, I will finish up today's episode with our recommendation of the week. And this week, I'm going to be recommending another podcast. Uh, And it dawned on me that I completely forgot to recommend this podcast last year on the show. I think I recommended it to pretty much everyone I know. Uh, Anyone that I know that is into podcasts, I was like, OMG, you absolutely need to download this. It's amazing. I actually think this is probably in my top three at the moment for uh, true crime. I'm going to put it in that category. True crime, but not gruesome true crime. The podcast is Sweet Bobby. And this basically tells the story of an extremely elaborate catfishing scam that was perpetrated on a woman in the UK over a really long period of time. 
This one absolutely blew my mind on so many levels. Uh, it is very well produced. The story itself could not be more shocking. Uh, like, I, I literally don't even know what to say. If you like the show Catfished, or Cat, I think that's what it's called, Catfished, if you like that genre, then this is an absolute must listen. This was just one of those stories that stays with you for a really, really long time and makes you go, wow, people really are capable of awful things. Uh, but I, I mean, I don't think that's giving anything away. You will have to listen to find out sort of how it all went down, what happened. Uh, but that one was incredible, a very, very, very good podcast. Uh, so if you are interested in those kind of stories, if you do like the true crime genre, like things that actually happen in society to other people, it, it doesn't involve a murder. Uh, so if that's, you know, where you draw the line with your murder mystery podcasts, then I think this one's going to be a safe one for you to listen to. But this one was mind-blowing on so many different levels. I have recommended it, like, to friends, family, <laughs> pretty much anyone I know that listens to podcasts. I'm like, you need to listen to this. This is amazing. Also because it's one of those ones that I then want to go away and discuss with people. So, you know, you kind of like go and listen to it and then let's talk about it. So if you fall into that category, if you're looking for something else to listen to after you finish listening to this, then go and download Sweet Bobby if you haven't already. Uh, literally, just, yeah, crazy, absolutely crazy. So I will finish up the show for this week here. I will be back in your ears shortly with some more K-Beauty goodness. And in the meantime, I will see you on Style Story. Style Story.